Hello, we know each other, but you don't. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Patrice Harris, the 174th president of the American Medical Association. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Neva Lubin Johnson, the 119th president of the National Medical Association. But now here we are. That's right. Uh, two presidents, at least for the <laughs> next, what, month or so. Uh, actually, what's today? The 12th? 18 yes, days. 18 days. 18 <laughs> days. Uh, but I'm just glad. I know you and I have known one another for many years and worked together at the AMA. And so I am very honored and exciting that our presidencies overlap for 18 days or so, about 30 <laughs> days or so. But let me ask you, actually, at the NMA, you are the first woman to be president, speaker, and chair of the board. Quite a significant accomplishment for you to have all three of those roles at the NMA. Tell me a little bit about uh, what it feels like to be a first, but to be a first in all three of those roles. So thank you. Uh, I appreciate the time you're taking for us to have this conversation today. And congratulations on your presidency and actually our overlap, although we're t taping a little later, ends up being about seven weeks. That's right. Yeah, That's right. so it ends up being about seven weeks, 42 days. And so I'm getting to the tail end of mine, uh, a point you'll, you'll relish at some point. <laughs> uh, but being the first in those three roles, uh, it's a good feeling. Um, it's a feeling of excitement uh, when it occurred when I was elected president-elect. Uh, my journey is a little bit different in that I hit probably those milestones in a different decade each. Uh, uh -huh. I was speaker in the 90s. I became chairman of the board in 2009 and then got elected president-elect in 2017. Uh, and so uh, it's been a journey, but it's been a good one, and I've uh, enjoyed every minute of it. You know, one of the things that I have said often is our responsibility or a responsibility of any first is mm -hmm. to make sure we're not the last. How do you think uh, you will do that um, at the mm -hmm. NMA? I think encouraging women, more women to go into leadership. We actually now have the current speaker is a woman who has also been chair of the board. So if she desires to be president, she has that in her future, actually. And so there's potential there. But even younger women to start out with wanting to be, you know, just as I was, local officer and state officer, and then pursue whatever track they may want to, that leads to um, national leadership. What do you think um, we should tell young women, um, and actually young boys um, from communities of color about the opportunities or the lack thereof. You mentioned women in leadership. Of course, you and I are, are both examples that you can aspire to both careers in medicine and leadership opportunities, but we know the record um, in our country is dismal regarding women in leadership positions, academic institutions, other healthcare institutions, and it's even worse for women of color. So what should we do to increase the number of women uh, who, number one, aspire to leadership, but not only aspire to leadership, actually attain that aspiration. I think we have a responsibility to younger women to be mentors and sponsors for them. You know, mentorship means, yes, being uh, someone who can give support and leadership and suggestions of advice to along the way, but sponsorship means literally walking with someone as they move up and helping them get through the ranks of wherever their profession is. So I think we all have a responsibility to do that in terms of increasing the number of numbers of women um, aspiring to be leadership, be it in a professional organization or the academic institution, or if they work with a large group practice, I think we should encourage them all to move in that direction. You know, one of the, the, the problems that I think you and I and others have mm -hmm. to solve is the time. Mm -hmm. I'm sure people come up to you, women come up to you at mm -hmm. meetings after you speak at a meeting and they say, will you be my sponsor? Will you mentor me? Mm -hmm. And though both of us probably would love to mentor each and every one right. of the young women and men who 
uh, come up to us. How, we, we can't. I mean, you and I are just two people. I, I, I noticed in one of your Facebook posts, you mentioned that you haven't been successful in cloning yourself. <laughs> and so since we are not there yet, how do we spread this? What opportunities um, should we take advantage of to be sponsors, but be mentors, but in a bigger way? Well, I think we both have had the opportunity where we both built networks, you know, of those that we know who can actually be those mentors or those sponsors. And so just this week, I got a, a message from a student at my alma mater, Southern Illinois, that she needs to do a couple of electives in plastic surgery and has had problems finding somewhere to do them. And so what did I do? I sought out someone we both know who's an AMA and an NMA member active in both. And I said, hey, I need some help. And lo and behold, she made a suggestion of somebody I already knew um, and just totally forgot off my radar screen. And in terms of mentorship to others, I always, you know, look at where, where they're from or what specialty they go, they want to go into because I'm an internist. I might not be able to help you get into anesthesia, you know, but I may know someone who, it, who you know, is an anesthesiologist who can assist with helping you to move forward or if they're at a certain institution, know someone there or in the same city. And so I think that's how we get with the issue of time and helping them with the issue of time. And sometimes, you know, you keep those that you have found to mentor along the way. I started mentoring a young woman when she was a second year in medical school. She texted me the other day, hey, can we, when can we have brunch? I just started my first job as an attending, oh, need some you. advice. Uh, oh, by the way, she's a psychiatrist. You like that? Oh, okay. that's good. More psychiatrists. <laughs> that's right. Yes, that's yes. right. So, um, so you know, I've kept her as a as a mentee, and she's actually started a mentorship program of her own. And so, I think that's how you know you do, you know you choose to keep the ones you have, but you also build a network so that you're able to share share those people in your network uh, with those you come across. So, I have one more question because I know you have some questions for me, mm -hmm. but. Um, the other issue that you and I have talked about a lot over the years is how NMA mm -hmm. and AMA can work together. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on how we continue to build um, our relationship and make sure that we partner on the issues that are facing everyone, mm -hmm. but particularly uh, African Americans, mm -hmm. and in light of our new, the AMA's new Center uh, on Health Act? Mm -hmm. So, first of all, I applaud AMA for developing and creating the Center for Health Equity and definitely applaud you for the selection of our NMA member, Aletha Maybanks, uh, as uh, the, the vice president and director of that center. I think it's a great find, uh, and I think she'll do well for, for both organizations in that position. But I think what we can do together is really continue to work on the things that we've separately been working on, but maybe come to get, coming together in some aspects. You know, one is the issue of achieving health equity, which you talked about with the center and what we can do in that space. Um, we need to, of course, improve diversity in numbers of those going into medical school. Um, so I think that's an area where we definitely can, can come together. And I, and I promised you the last question, but and you and I have chatted about this before, mm -hmm. but when I've had the opportunity over the last several months to go around and talk to folks, um, I hear that, um, well, what is AMA and NMA, what are they working on together? And I've not seen any partnerships. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that we've been working on issues for years. And of mm -hmm. course, you are a prime example, you and many others who have been long term members of the NMA who are actively engaged and involved at the AMA. So one of the reasons I wanted to do this, and I, I believe you wanted to do this as well, was an opportunity to elevate and amplify work that is already occurring, partnerships, the engagement mm -hmm. um, in both of our organizations. So that's the other um, opportunity that I think we have. And again, it certainly doesn't end no. uh, <laughs> as you're presidency in. So I, I know that you and I will continue to work on these issues. Definitely, definitely. You know, we've been able to work, uh, we each, you know, find the focus on the need for helping physicians in terms of decreasing burnout. You know, it's very important in addition to the issue of health equity, but also decreasing uh, the occurrence and incidence of gun violence in this community is another area where we're both working on 
Um, and so I think, you know, opportunities are there um, in those areas, definitely, uh, you know, amongst others. For our convention this year, you know, you've agreed to participate on our plenary session panel on physician burnout because, like I said before, that's an area of focus for both organizations. And we are doing uh, a session on gun violence for our Mazik Symposium, our health policy forum, um, also for our convention this year. And so, you know, I think that, you know, parts of that will get out to AMA members also so that they can see and become more involved in MMA also. Okay. All right. So question for you is, you know, how do you see um, AMA working in the space to help improve the numbers of those underrepresented going to medical school? Well, I think uh, we start uh, by building networks and I believe convening, in my opinion, an opportunity to convene everyone that's working on pipeline programs. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone talks about pipeline programs are, are increasingly important if we want to increase the diversity of the physician workforce. And I know many pipeline programs are out there, but I wonder um, what we're learning from those programs and how can we better coordinate those programs and amplify that work. So I believe that's important. I think you also know that um, I am a strong believer that this is not AMA's or NMA's problem alone. This is not physicians' problem alone to solve. As a child psychiatrist, I see the critical importance of starting early, mm -hmm. making right. sure that our youth are healthy, socio-emotionally, mm -hmm. uh, zero to six years, that they can modulate their emotions, succeed in school. If you succeed in elementary school, you're reading on grade level, greater opportunity to succeed in your later years, which of course builds a strong foundation for careers in the STEM field. So, you know, I believe that AMA can convene, can coordinate, can collaborate the many stakeholders and partners that are working in this issue so that we can certainly move the needle. Um, as you well know, mm -hmm. the numbers of African American men mm -hmm. are not increasing right. and in fact worse uh, than they were decades ago. And so that's an area where we certainly have to uh, give some added uh, emphasis. And, and I believe that under the umbrella of our, our new Center for Health Equity and Dr. Aletha Maybank will be able to do that. I also know that um, we need to make sure that health equity and, and care and passion for these issues are not just at the center, mm -hmm. but are embedded in the DNA of not just AMA, and I imagine it's embedded in the DNA of NMA, but not just AMA, but our educational institutions and our medical schools, and again, our educational system. So this is certainly a broader issue, but I believe a AMA can serve to amplify this issue and coordinate and collaborate and bring, bring folks together. Um, finally, collect the data. Right, um, right. You know, we need to know what's working right. and what's not working. Right. And what's working will continue, will improve, and what's not working so let's talk about what AMA is doing in terms of the Improving Healthy Outcome Program and, you know, plans for the future. You know, I'm very excited and have been about our work regarding our strategic priority of improving health outcomes. We looked at many areas, but decided to focus in on two, and that is pre-diabetes and hypertension. And certainly I think there's some synergy there because I think you and I both know that unfortunately people from communities of color um, often live sicker and die younger. Mm -hmm. and oftentimes it's due to the burden of diseases like uh, diabetes and hypertension and heart disease. But you know, one of the things I'm most excited about is the AMA's focus on pre-diabetes. I think we ask the question, what if? What if we could prevent people from getting uh, type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. wouldn't we be able to not only save healthcare dollars, but really decrease suffering? And again, that suffering is, is greater in our communities. I have to tell a story several years ago. I used to be on the board of the Georgia Charitable Care Network and uh, way before the Affordable Care Act. And uh, 
we, we sponsored a day where those who are uninsured could come and get services. Mm -hmm. I got there that morning around 530. I left that night at nine o'clock. And it was so many heartbreaking stories mm -hmm. of folks who had blood pressures, 190 over 160. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the most heartbreaking stories was a woman and I know you know this, I'm a psychiatrist, but a woman whose blood pressure was 190 over 160. And I was really worried about her. And I wanted her to go to Grady mm -hmm. to seek emergency right. care in the evening. And she did not want to go because she was worried about the cost. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's so important for us to get to elevate these issues and, and work with our communities to see what we can do to prevent uh, diabetes and to make sure that folks who have high blood pressure get the care mm -hmm. that they need. So that's uh, where the AMA is on that issue. And I know those issues are a great concern to members of the NMA. So definitely, and during the NMA convention, you and I will be participating on a panel during the uh, internal medicine section on hypertension and cardiovascular disease um, and helping to improve outcomes related to both of those things. Uh, personally, um, I have experiences in both the diabetes space and the hypertension space, even in spite of, I should say, being an internist. Uh, my brother died from complications of diabetes at 44. Uh, my dad had a life-changing uh, stroke um, in 1998. Fortunately, he lived another 13, 14 years. Uh, but for him, it was, uh, he ran out of his blood pressure medicine. I didn't know it. Um, I had a closet full of what he needed, didn't know it, um, and unfortunately he had the stroke, but he was able to rehabilitate from that to the point where he was able to drive again, walk again, talk again, speed himself again, all those things he initially could not do and was fairly functional for most of the remainder of his life. So it is good that we are bringing that issue out to the forefront. Um, you know, for those across America to see, to help prevent them from that. And um, as a prelude to what is now the Improving Health Outcomes space and hypertension, I was actually one of those who participated um, as a in the pilot project that brought about uh, the hypertension pro project. And um, I, you know, I still use those tools today in terms of watching people get their blood pressure taken in the emergency room or when I'm working and, you know, be flat, sit back, um, have you been to the bathroom, all those things that can alter a blood pressure reading. So um, it is it is good that we are both, you know, working in, the, in that space to help improve uh, the control of high blood pressure and prevent diabetes, um, you know, for both uh, the, the patients that we see um, in, in our communities. And that's just another great example of how our organizations work together Definitely. and how the AMA really wants to make an impact on the practices of mm -hmm. physicians who are caring for patients um, across this country. And I, so I just mm -hmm. want to say, even though you are a part of the mm -hmm. AMA, but thank you for being a part of that pilot work um, because I believe that work uh, will continue to be um, life changing, but we have to figure out and we will, mm -hmm how to amplify that mm -hmm. and, right. and let everyone know that these tools are available. And again, both organizations are here to help right. uh, physicians um, take better care of, of our patients. Yes, definitely, definitely. So I wanted to ask you a question about, you know, gender diversity in medicine. We touched on it before. You're the first African-American female to be president of AMA in the 174 year history. But, you know, we're at this great place in history where the president, the immediate past president, and the president-elect are all women. I believe you're number six. Uh, six I'm number five. You're number five. Sue, Sue Bailey, Bailey will number be number six. six. Yes. All right. In terms of female presidents. And so what do you think can be done to help increase a particular participation of women in AMA in terms of, you know, striving to be in a leadership position? I think we first have to identify women and identify opportunities and let women know, first of all, that the organization is a, a welcoming organization, which I hope uh, by virtue of the fact that this is a historic moment again with the three presidents being women. And then lead uh, by example. 
I, I remember um, several years when I uh, years ago when I first uh, started coming to AMA meetings, Dr. Nancy Nielsen, mm -hmm. who was in leadership at the time, she was speaker, mm -hmm. and she convened all the women who were involved at AMA. And really, we took up a medium-sized conference room. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, we would need a huge room, and I think that's progress. But she tells the story about when she first started the AMA, they could meet in a hotel room. Mm -hmm. So we are making progress, but we have to make sure that we um, offer ample opportunities for leadership development. I mean, I don't know about you, people ask me, how did you train to be a leader? And I have to say that I've had some formal training, mm -hmm. some on the job training, I think, Formal training is is a good idea, and I know our women's physician sec, uh, section, of which uh, you are the chair. The chair. That's what I thought. So that's mm -hmm. another thing. How I many all these jobs you've had, <laughs> of which you are the chair, um, does a great job in identifying barriers uh, to to participation for women. I, I uh, you may, I know you know this. Uh, several years ago, we began offering childcare. Yes. However. You can just say that NMA has been doing that for many years. In fact, we modeled, AMA modeled, our child care uh, provider off of what M NMA has been doing for right. so many years, Camp NMA. NMA. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, it, that's another thing is on-site uh, child care um, so that women can attend meetings, opportunities for participation in meetings uh, using technology, I think is another area where we can um, enhance our participation. Mm -hmm. um, but I think women and any people want to know, physicians want to know that AMA and NMA are fighting for them. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, the women's physician section does a great job in elevating issues around gender pay and the barriers and discrimination that women are uh, subjected to when they do try to aspire to leadership positions. So I think that uh, our women's physician section does a great job, again, of identifying issues, but not only identifying issues, but really offering solutions. Right. You know, right. here, here's what you can do uh, to enhance participation of women in medicine. So I think I might hats off to you and Thank that you. section. I do want to say that I uh, used to be, as you know, a mm -hmm. member of the governing council when it was just a, uh, a women's physician congress. Mm -hmm and not a section. But I think those are opportunities where AMA, again, uh, demonstrates leadership and its commitment to enhancing um, gender diversity in our organization. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you for those compliments. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be on the Governing Council for the past two years, and although I've just been chair for a few weeks, I am enjoying it. Looking forward to uh, September being Women in Medicine Month. Uh, hopefully, we'll be announcing who is going to come in to Chicago and do a webinar. Uh, we, we have an invitation out for someone who has some experience in that space. Okay. We were overjoyed to have Esther Chu here um, at the convention this, this past June to talk about uh, gender, equi gender pay equity um, and hear what the data is and that. And we have a great group on that governing council. We do. Um, the associates luncheon allows us to dialogue in specific areas and get some mentorship and suggestions also on how to uh, advance as women in our profession, but also in leadership in AMA. So well, that's a great tease. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to uh, <laughs> finding out who that is. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's very exciting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So, Nevi, let me just say it's been a delight. A to get to know you over the years and to be on the speaking circuit with you over this last year as I've been president-elect and you're president of the NMA. And thank you uh, for joining me here today. And I look forward to uh, many years of partnership to come. Um, over the last several months, I've been introducing you as my partner in advocacy. And so I'm sure we will continue uh, to do that, to advocate for physicians and the patients that we care for. And I want to thank you for having me here at the AMA headquarters to do this interview of each other today. I've enjoyed it also, and I look forward to us continuing together as partners in health, as you've also introduced me as um, in the years to come. Very good.